Part one of Part fifth of Trilby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Kurt Boulet. Trilby by Georges Dumouriez. Part fifth. Part one. Little Billy, an interlude. Then the mortal coldness of the soul like death itself comes down. It cannot feel for others' woes. It dare not dream its own. That heavy chill has frozen o'er the fountain of our tears. And, though the eye may sparkle yet, tis where the ice appears. The wit may flash from fluent lips and mirth distract the breast. Through midnight hours that yield no more their former hope of rest. Tis but as ivy leaves around a room turret wreath, all green and widely fresh without, but worn and grey beneath. When Taffy and the laird went back to the studio in the place Saint Anatole des Arts, and resumed their ordinary life there, it was with a sense of desolation and dull bereavement beyond anything they could have imagined, and this did not seem to lessen as the time wore on. They realized for the first time how keen and penetrating and unintermittent had been the charm of those two central figures, Trilby and Little Billy, and how hard it was to live without them, after such intimacy as had been theirs. Oh, it has been a jolly time, though it didn't last long. So Trilby had written in her farewell letter to Taffy, and these words were true for Taffy and the laird as well as for her. And that is the worst of those dear people who have charm. They are so terrible to do without, when once you have got accustomed to them and all their ways. And when, besides being charming, they are simple, clever, affectionate, constant and sincere, like Trilby and little Billy, then the lamentable hole their disappearance makes is not to be filled up. And when they are full of genius, like little Billy, and like Trilby, funny without being vulgar, for so she always seemed to the laird and taffy, even in French, in spite of her Gallic audacities of thought, speech, and gesture. All seemed to have suffered change. The very boxing and fencing were gone through perfunctorily, for mere health's sake, and a thin layer of adipose deposit began to soften the outlines of the heels and dales on taffy's mighty forearm. Dodor and Zuzu no longer came so often, now that the charming little Billy and his charming mother, and still more charming sister, had gone away. Nor Carnegie, nor Antony, nor Lorimer, nor Vincent, nor the Greek. Jacko never came at all. Even Svengeli was missed, little as he had been liked. It is a dismal and sulky-looking piece of furniture, a grand piano that nobody ever plays, with all its sound and its souvenirs locked up inside, a kind of mausoleum, a lopsided coffin, trestles and all. So it went back to London by the little quickness, just as it had come. Thus Taffy and the laird grew quite sad and moppy, and lunched at the Café de l'Odéon every day, till the goodness of the omelettes palled, and the redness of the wine there got on their nerves and into their heads and faces, and made them sleepy till dinner-time. And then, waking up, they dressed respectably, and dined expensively, like gentlemen, in the Palais Royal, or the Passage Choiseul, or the Passage des Panorama, for three francs, three francs fifty, even five francs a head, and half a franc to the waiter, and went to the theatre almost every night, on that side of the water, and more often than not they took a cab home, each smoking a panatelas, which cost twenty-five centimes, five sous, two shillings and top pence. Then they feebly drifted into quite decent society, like Lorimer and Carnegie, with dress coats and white ties on, and their hair parted in the middle and down the back of the head, and brought over the ears in a bunch at each side, as was the English fashion in those days, and subscribed to Galignani's messenger, and had themselves proposed and seconded for the Cercle Anglais in the Rue saint nitouche a circle of British Philistines of the very deepest dye, and went to hear divine service on Sunday mornings in Rue Marbeuf. Indeed, by the end of the summer, they had sunk into such depth of demoralization that they felt they must really have a change, 
and decided on giving up the studio in the Place Saint Anatole des Arts and leaving Paris for good, and going to settle for the winter in Dusseldorf, which is a very pleasant place for English painters who do not wish to overwork themselves, as the laird well knew, having spent a year there. It ended in Taffy's going to Antwerp for the Kermesse, to paint the Flemish drunkard of our time just as he really is, and the laird's going to Spain, so that he might study Toreador's from the life. I may as well state here that the laird's Toreador pictures, which had had quite a vogue in Scotland as long as he had been content to paint D.M. in the Place saint anatole des Arts, quite ceased to please, or sell, after he had been to Seville and Madrid. So he took to painting Roman cardinals and Neapolitan piferari from the depth of his consciousness, and was so successful that he made up his mind he would never spoil his market by going to Italy. So he went and painted his cardinals and his piferari in Algiers, and Taffy joined him there and painted Algerian Jews just as they really are, and didn't sell them. And then they spent a year in Munich, and then a year in Dusseldorf, and a winter in Cairo and so on. And all this time Taffy, who took everything au grand sérieux, especially the claims and obligations of friendship, corresponded regularly with little Billy, who wrote him long and amusing letters back again, and had plenty to say about his life in London, which was a series of triumphs, artistic and social, and you would have thought from his letters, modest though they were, that no happier young man, or more elate, was to be found anywhere in the world. It was a good time in England, just then, for young artists of promise, a time of evolution, revolution, change and development, of the founding of new schools and the crumbling away of old ones, a keen struggle for existence, a surviving of the fit, a preparation, let us hope, for the ultimate survival of the fittest. And among the many glories of this particular period, Two names stand out very conspicuously, for the immediate and, so far, lasting fame their bearers achieved, and the wide influence they exerted, and continue to exert still. The world will not easily forget Frederick Walker and William Baggert, those two singularly gifted boys, whom it soon became the fashion to bracket together, to compare and to contrast, as one compares and contrasts Thackeray and Dickens, Carlyle and Macaulay, Tennyson and Browning, a futile though pleasant practice, of which the temptations seem irresistible. Yet why compare the lily and the rose? These two young masters had the genius and the luck to be the progenitors of much of the best artwork that has been done in England during the last thirty years, in oils, in watercolor, in black and white. They were both essentially English and of their own time, both absolutely original, receiving their impressions straight from nature itself. Uninfluenced by any school, ancient or modern, they founded schools instead of following any, and each was a law unto himself, and a law-giver unto many others. Both were equally great in whatever they attempted, landscape, figures, birds, beasts or fishes. Who does not remember the fishmonger's shop by F. Walker? or W. Baggert's little piebald piglings, and their venerable black mother, and their immense fat wallowing pink pepper. An ineffable charm of poetry and refinement, of pathos and sympathy, and delicate humor combined, an incomparable ease and grace and felicity of workmanship, belong to each. And yet in their work, are they not as wide apart as the poles, each complete in himself, and yet a complement to the other? And, oddly enough, they were both singularly alike in aspect, both small and slight, though beautifully made, with tiny hands and feet, always arrayed as the lilies of the field, for all they toiled and spun so arduously. Both had regularly featured faces of a noble cast and most winning character. Both had the best and simplest manners in the world, and no way of getting themselves much and quickly and permanently liked. Que la terreur leur soit légère. And who can say that the fame of one is greater than the others? Their pinnacles are twin, I venture to believe, of just an equal height and width and thickness, like their bodies in this life. 
but unlike their frail bodies in one respect, no taller pinnacles are to be seen, methinks, in all the garden of the deathless dead painters of our time, and none more built to last. But it is not with the art of little Billy, nor with his fame as a painter, that we are chiefly concerned in this unpretending little tale, except in so far as they have some bearing on his character and his fate. I should like to know the detailed history of the Englishman's first love, and how he lost his innocence. Ask him! Ask him yourself! Thus Paplar and Bouchardy, on the morning of little Billy's first appearance at Carrel's studio, in the Rue des Potirons Saint Michel. And that is the question the present scribe is doing his little best to answer. A good-looking, famous, well-bred, and well-dressed youth finds that London society opens its door very readily. He hasn't long to knock, and it would be difficult to find a youth more fortunately situated, handsomer, more famous, better dressed, or better bred, more seemingly happy and successful, with more attractive qualities and more condonable faults, than little Billy, as Taffy and the laird found him when they came to London after their four or five years in foreign parts, their Vandaria. He had a fine studio and a handsome suite of rooms in Fitzroy Square. Beautiful specimens of his unfinished work, endless studies, hung on his studio walls. Everything else was as nice as it could be, the furniture, the bibelot, and bric a brac the artistic foreign and eastern knick-knacks, and draperies, and hangings, and curtains, and rugs, the semi-grand piano by Collard and Collard. That immortal canvas, the moon-dial, just begun, and already commissioned by Moses Lyon, the famous picture-dealer, lay on his easel. No man worked harder and with teeth more clenched than little Billy when he was at work, None rested or played more discreetly when it was time to rest or play. The glass on his mantelpiece was full of cards of invitation, reminders, pretty mauve and pink and lilac-scented notes, nor were coronets wanting on many of these hospitable little missives. He had quite overcome his fancied aversion for bloated dukes and lords and the rest. We all do sooner or later, if things go well with us especially for their wives and sisters and daughters and female cousins, even their mothers and aunts. In point of fact, and in spite of his tender years, he was in some danger, for his art, of developing into that type so adored by sympathetic women who haven't got much to do. The friend, the tame cat, the platonic lover, with many loves, the squire of dames, the trusty one, of whom husbands and brothers have no fear, the delicate, harmless dilettante of Eros, the dainty shepherd who dwells dans le pays du tendre, and stops there. The woman flatters, and the man confides, and there is no danger whatever, I'm told, and I'm glad. One man loves his fiddle, or, alas, his neighbors sometimes, for all the melodies he can wake from it. It is but a selfish love, Another, who is no fiddler, may love a fiddle too, for its symmetry, its neatness, its color, its delicate grainings, the lovely lines and curves of its back and front, for its own sake, so to speak. He may have a whole gallery full of fiddles to love in this innocent way, a harem, and yet not know a single note of music, or even care to hear one. He will dust them and stroke them and take them down and try to put them in tune, pizzicato, and put them back again and call them ever such sweet little pet exotic names. Viol, viola, viola d'amore, viol di gamba, violino mio, and breathe his little troubles into them and they will give back inaudible little murmurs in sympathetic response, like a damp aeolian harp but he will never draw a bow across the strings, nor wake a single chord, or discord. And who shall say he is not wise in his generation? It is but an old-fashioned Philistine notion that fiddles were only made to be played on. The fiddles themselves are beginning to resent it, and rightly, I wot. 
In this harmless fashion, little Billy was friends with more than one fine lady, de par le monde. Indeed, he had been reproached by his more bohemian brothers of the brush for being something of a tuft hunter, most unjustly. But nothing gives such keen offence to our unsuccessful brother, bohemian or bourgeois, as our sudden intimacy with the so-called great, the little lords and ladies of this little world. Not even our fame and success, and all the joy and pride they bring us, are so hard to condone, so embittering, so humiliating, to the jealous fraternal heart. Alas, poor humanity, that the mere countenance of our betters, if they are our betters, should be thought so priceless a boon, so consummate an achievement, so crowning a glory as all that. A dirty bit of orange peel, the stump of a cigar, once trod on by a princely heel, how beautiful they are! Little Billy was no tuft hunter. He was the tuft hunted, or had been. No one of his kind was ever more persistently, resolutely, hospitably harried than this young hare with many friends, by people of rank and fashion. And at first he thought them most charming, as they so often are, these graceful, gracious, gay, good-natured stoics and barbarians, whose manners are as easy and simple as their morals, but how much better, and who, at least, have this charm, that they can wallow in untold cold, when they happen to possess it, without ever seeming to stink of the same. Yes, they bear wealth gracefully, and the want of it more gracefully still, and these are pretty accomplishments that have yet to be learned by our new aristocracy of the shop and counting house, Jew or gentle, which is everywhere elbowing its irresistible way to the top and front of everything, both here and abroad. Then he discovered that, much as you might be with them, you could never be of them, unless perchance you managed to hook on by marrying one of their ugly ducklings, their failures, their remnants, and even then life isn't all beer and skittles for a rank outsider, I'm told. Then he discovered that he didn't want to be of them in the least, especially at such a cost as that, and that to be very much with them was apt to pull, like everything else. Also, he found that they were very mixed, good, bad, and indifferent, and not always very dainty or select in their predilections, since they took unto their bosoms such queer outsiders, just for the sake of being amused a little while, that their capricious favour ceased to be an honour and a glory, if it ever was, and then their fickleness. Indeed, he found, or thought he found, that they could be just as clever, as liberal, as polite or refined, as narrow, insolent, swaggering, coarse and vulgar, as handsome, as ugly, as graceful, as ungainly, as modest or conceited, as any other upper class of the community, and indeed some lower ones. Beautiful young women, who had been taught how to paint pretty little landscapes, with an ivy-mantled rune in the middle distance, talked technically of painting to him, de père à père, as though they were quite on the same artistic level, and didn't mind admitting it in spite of the social gulf between. Hideous old frumps, ushers or bees, yet with unduly bared necks and shoulders that made him sick, patronized him and gave him good advice, and told him to emulate Mr. Buckner, both in his genius and his manners, since Mr. Buckner was the only gentleman who ever painted for hire, and they promised him, in time, an equal success. End of part one, part fifth. Recording by Nadine Eckert-Boulet in 2010, Copenhagen, Denmark.